Well, thanks so much, uh, Congressman, for joining us today. This is for everybody listening. My name is Dan Spooler, and I'm the co-chairman of the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative. And I've been in the crypto space for quite a while now, and I've had the op uh, op uh, honor of interacting with Congressman uh, Ted Budd over the, uh, over the past uh, couple years and a few different occasions. And we're just thrilled to uh, have you today. And I'd love to dive right in, but uh, because you have such an incredible perspective uh, in this industry. But first, uh, uh, perhaps you can just give us an overview of who you are and an origin story. Uh, for, for our listeners. Yeah, I, I don't want to take up your, your whole allotted time, but again, thank you. Um, it's great to have somebody, you know, serving in North Carolina like yourself, and it's an important role, especially with a lot of the, um, the fintech um, uh, technologies that we're seeing around Charlotte and Cary area. It's just a, it's an amazing state with a, with a great future. So uh, for me, look, I grew up on a farm, so you would wonder like, why in the heck would I be interested in this? Um, you know, I had some pretty traditional business background um, and still am a small business owner. But I, I'm always looking, I've always had a fascination with technology that dates back even before the Apple IIe. Uh, and I've always wanted to see how do you create value through the application of technology? You know, if that's in agriculture, if that's in business, if that's in um, business management and information systems, I've always wondered how do you do that? But now I've, I'm on this committee, Financial Services, uh, which mm -hmm. is fascinating. So when you run for office, you got to you realize once you win that you got to run again, and that's to try to get on a good committee. And and for North Carolina, this is a amazing committee. Um, so I came in in twenty, I won in twenty sixteen, sworn in in twenty seventeen, and started realizing that the more we can reduce the friction of transactions, the faster our economy can grow, and the more opportunity to more people. So I see this as blockchain, cryptocurrencies as one way to um, uh, one way to speed up um, or reduce the friction of, of tech, uh, reduce the friction of transactions. Right. Yeah, that's certainly that's and a I little think, bit of the background. No, thank you for that. And I know you're also on the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Uh, did you join that right away as soon as you were elected or did you learn more about it? When, I, when we figure out it's a thing, first of all, yeah. like, oh, it exists, then yes. I mean, uh, it was not anything I had to scratch my head and wonder about. I said, well, this is where things are going, and we might as well get there and understand it. And remember, we're about creating frameworks for you all uh, to do well mm -hmm. here. We're not inventing things here in Congress, or at least we shouldn't be in that business. And so we might in our own private selves uh, as 435 members of the House or 100 in the Senate. But but as far as us, we just create uh frameworks uh, out of which you all can do really well and we can as a country can be very competitive. Uh, it was something I signed on to pretty early. Yeah, and it sounds like you really uh, you really dived right in. I remember in Gen January 2019, last year, you introduced a bill called the Financial Protection Act of 2019 uh, with Congressman Stephen Lynch. and. Uh, the chair of the House Financial, the then chair uh, and still chair Maxine Waters had the rules suspended to bring your bill to the floor, which is, you know, that's, that's fantastic news. And I know Patrick McHenry, a fellow North Carolinian, also a ranking member, spoke very highly of this bill and praised you for your bipartisan nature um, that you used to work with everybody. Um, what was the key to you to bringing crypto and blockchain legislation to Congress in such a bipartisan fashion? Yeah, the bipartisan is a key word. Look, we, we are in a very partisan world today, a very partisan um, country. But at the same time, we look for pockets of things that we can agree on. And this is certainly something. Uh, this is helpful to everyone. Um, no one uh, of either party owns this space, which is why, you know, I can work on this with Stephen Lynch and Maxine Waters. Uh, we realize it's good for their districts, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, and Davie County, North Carolina, uh, where I'm from, uh, including you know Charlotte and Cary and other larger metro areas. Um, but you just want to, it's great for the country and it hasn't fallen into a partisan pocket. And um, I just think that's one of the reasons it was able to really just race through um, at record speed and glad to have their support. Uh, there's plenty of things worth fighting on, but this is not one of them. Exactly, and I think that's how most of the business community in this industry feel. Um, so that's great news that you're able to collaborate with different uh, both parties, and that's the, that's the key is bipartisanship here. So many of our listeners really aren't up to speed, most likely, on the bill process, uh, in, in the, the bill writing and passing and lawmaking process in Washington D.C. Um, your bill was passed by a House voice vote, and then it was referred to the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. What exactly does that mean for the future of the bill? And have you? identified a U.S. Senator, an ally uh, on that side of the chamber, um, perhaps Crapo after news from yesterday. 
Dan, well, you might have to fill me in on what's yesterday. I've been focusing on several different things <laughs> in, this, in this crazy world. So fill me in. I'm glad to comment on it. But when it passes by voice vote, what that means is it's not just passed, um, you, you know, by the, you know, by thin margins, but it passed unanimously. It's not controversial. Kind of go back to my earlier comments, which mm -hmm. teased it up to go through the Senate uh, and even quicker. So that's, that's exciting. Uh, nobody's against it. However, it just now depends on priorities uh, from the House or from the Senate um, and where uh, the Senate Banking Committee, a little different name over there, uh, mm -hmm. and how they want to want to push it forward. I have not heard uh, anything unless you want to fill me in on the last few hours uh, from Mike Crapo and if this fits his priorities. Uh, this is a political year. This is it, sure. it's 2020. There's lots of things. I mean, we all want to get through 2020, I think. Um, but on top of that, it's also a political season. Um, and so a lot of things are going to be tuned to how it's going to affect election outcomes in November. So that's what moves things forward. That's what slows things down. And if it advances uh, the Senate, then, um, then you know, we'll see it. Mm -hmm. But if not, it's a marker bill for early 2021. Yeah, I was referring to Senator Crapo because uh, yesterday, and again, this is uh, uh, July 1st at the, well, while we speak. Um, I think he had some positive comments yesterday on the digital dollar, and we can actually move over into that conversation because you said, as you pointed out, you sit on the power house, uh, powerful House Financial Services Committee and recently interacted with uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jer uh, Jer Jerome Powell as he testified on a variety of topics, monetary policy, uh, low interest rates, uh, the unemployment rate from the COVID-19 shutdowns, the coin shortage, and the future of economic growth and recovery from this virus. And there have been several hearings on, uh, in the House and the Senate on the topic of the digital dollar. And recently, Powell said that he, didn't, he did see it as a, um, proper for the private sector to be involved in the development of the digital dollar. I, I don't believe, I don't, excuse me, did not see that. Okay. Did not see that, right. Yeah, and so for, do you think- For the private sector. Yes. Were, his comments were for the or pro private sector, which was a concern. I mean, we, we started raising the flag on this way pre-COVID. I mean, this was mid or early of last year, um, concerned about the, the Fed eating up this space and then slowing it down as government tends to do. So we want to, uh, I mean, they, if they, kind of like my earlier comments, if we want to set a framework through the Fed, um, and then uh, once you have the rules, you go out and design the technology and make mm -hmm. it universally established, that would be great. But the more we can push it to the private sector, the better. Um, I mean, even in, to use an analogy of what we're facing right now with the coronavirus, we're seeing the best responses um, come from the private sector, whether it's PPE yeah. or, or whether it's, uh, whether it's vaccinations. It's not what the government's doing. It's what private sector is doing to help Americans. And I think digital dollar is going to flow the same way. It has, to, we can create a framework uh, and then, uh, and then it's up to the pri or private sector. And I think the United States in general needs to con pursue this. I mean, just to stay competitive in the global uh, econ economy. I mean, cause China clearly is doing this right now as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we look, I just left a, a China task force hearing saying that, remember, China is not our friend. We, this will, this technology will reside somewhere. It will grow um, regardless of whether we as the United States are engaged in it or not. So we have to determine, uh, do we want to be out front? Do we want it to be on our shores rather than somewhere else? Now, we might have an ally like Estonia uh, that's very digital friendly lead this or Singapore, definitely an ally. But it could land in Hong Kong, which was an ally until now long. Now it's no longer a, a separate, separate system, separate state. Um, now it's really been absorbed into a, what we now know is a bad actor, and that's China. Do we want it to be Chinese controlled? I don't think we do. Um, you, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think we have to be up front of this. We have to lead. We want it on our shores for competitive reasons, uh, for economic reasons, and for security reasons as well. Yeah, and just technology in general, I'm wondering, um, from your perspective on Capitol Hill, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic certainly has accelerated technology uh, even faster than it was prior and the need for it. Um, are you seeing any, it, it, are you seeing that too from your end? I mean, are you seeing more technological growth than uh, some of these uh, haste, hastening, if you will, of a lot of these technologies from a regulatory perspective of being considered now beyond the digital dollar? You, you really do because you see, I mean, go back to a couple, look at where we got Uber and Lyft and so much mm -hmm. technology that, that really kind of came out of that uh, 08, 09, 10 uh, recession. 
Um, and then go all the way backwards to 1918, which yeah. a telephone was pretty rare then uh, during that pandemic. But you couldn't get out and talk to your neighbor then. So that's when people wanted the telephone. And eventually we had the network effect of telephones and they became more and more valuable the more and more people that had them. And now you're seeing people, it was just a certain segment of the population. I was using Zoom five years ago, but yeah. now you're seeing almost everybody, you're, you're great everybody does. comfortable with Zoom. Now they might forget to turn off the mute or turn on the mute, but as we're seeing, but Pretty much. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, more and more people be comfortable with this technology. And we're having other leaps forward. I mean, I'm using communications, but uh, currency as well. A lot of people don't, I'm, I'm, we're seeing touchless contact become, you know, I, I've been using Apple Pay for a long time since it was uh, early and early. Um, mm -hmm. But but now we're seeing um, now we're seeing all kinds of touchless become common. That's just a couple of examples. Yeah, and that's really what happens. Like you pointed out, 1918, even the 2008 2009 financial crisis situations often uh, and great startups and great opportunities present themselves in times of crisis. So uh, yeah, that's it's a cataclysmic shift rather than just an incremental change. And I right. think yeah. this has been this has been global. So we're all on the same playing field here. And this has been uh, cataclysmic. You know, last summer, um, we all remember the hearings on Capitol Hill for the Libra project. And in mm -hmm. fact, I remember we, you made time to speak with myself and other industry leaders at your office. And your, your staff was terrific to help facilitate that um, during the week of the hearings and right. the Congressional Blockchain Education Day that uh, was, was held. Um, so it's been about a year. And I suppose my question is, in light of this Libra rollout. What a year it's been. <laughs> I know. What a year. I would have thought. What a half year it's been. It's only July compared to, it's, times have certainly changed. <laughs> my question, though, is for the Libra rollout, um, in, le in light of uh, these changes that have been made to Libra, has Facebook's Libra project um, poisoned the waters, if you will, uh, on the discussion around crypto and blockchain on Capitol Hill, or has it actually spurred more dialogue and more positive discussions? Yeah, definitely more dialogue, but not without, you know, some concern because of who uh, was doing mm -hmm. it. It was really on the heels of a lot of privacy concerns, a lot of suppression concerns from around Facebook. But certainly uh, there were, you know, the, the mammoth operator in the room. And so everybody had to pay attention to what Facebook was doing in this space. Now, it's not really cryptocurrency. I mean, it's a, it's right. a digital basket of other currencies kind of underwritten and surrounded by 28 other companies. 28 at the time, I think some may have dropped off uh, and changed their alliances. Um, but it was certainly interesting. And essentially, it wasn't even technology at that point. It was a concept written into a white paper. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant what Facebook did because it really stirred the pot and raised awareness uh, and the discussion of cryptocurrency, whether or not it technically was a cryptocurrency. And so everybody was talking about it. The vocabulary was becoming more commonplace around it. Um, and they, everyone on both parties raised all their concerns with Facebook and what they were doing. And so it was very educational for them. And if they put it on the back burner because of COVID-19 or for other reasons, then, then that's fine. But at least the discussion is out there for some of those who were forced into the, the discussion and weren't used to talking about crypto and, and blockchain. Yeah, that really stood out to me as somebody who had spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill and, and over the years and helped and, and worked to educate lawmakers on digital assets, uh, public key cryptography, uh, blockchain, etc. Um, that was really kind of a, a rapid rollout and um, baptism by fire because a lot of times this the Libra rollout, the white paper was the first time I think a lot of Congress members of Congress had really dove in and read about it. And I think uh, it reset the clock for a lot of our educational efforts, but folks like you and other members of the Blockchain Caucus were already well aware of what was, uh, what was going on in this ecosystem. So, and I know you asked some great questions during that time frame. Well, it was, it was very uh, it was personally interesting to me. You have, again, just for your listeners, um, there was the spectrum of members who were up to speed on this. And sometimes this is just generational, um, and sometimes it's purely worldview. One member even said, um, this is the digital version of 9-11 uh, for our country and our currency. Uh, and that's pretty extreme. And I think it's very off base for that member to have said that. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, you know, for all your viewers and listeners, that's, you realize that's what we're dealing with um, uh, around this technology. And then you have some are very pro and Facebook can just right. do whatever. But you, we also surface the, uh, uh, the concerns of, 
Facebook, if you are um, controlling certain uh, views and you're suppressing or shadow banning people, are you going to shadow ban transactions? Uh, if there's a legal transaction and, uh, and you don't like that transaction, are you going to suppress it or prevent it? And those are real issues and didn't get a full answer from uh, Mark Zuckerberg, but I really mm -hmm. encourage them. Hopefully somebody from Facebook will watch this. I'm sure they are. And they need to understand that we're really concerned that um, if people are going to use this as a transaction, they don't have a right to uh, suppress that as long as it's legal in the jurisdiction where the transaction takes place. So in addition to what a year it's been, we've also had a recent um, individual named Brian Brooks who's taken over now as the acting comptroller of the OCC. Uh, and what do you think of this in turn and, and some of his recent announcements regarding the possible payments charter and, and, and a look at rulemaking for crypto and blockchain? Have you, have you interacted with him yet? I mean, you've had any, uh, an opportunity to, in his new role as acting director, acting controller. So I had a conversation with him uh, about two, three weeks ago. Um, and it was a, a great conversation. I was pleasantly surprised. Of course, before I spoke with him, I just did a little background uh, research <laughs> on it. And I mean, you see this guy's got a Coinbase background, um, is just very skilled, kind of understands the uh, how Silicon Valley and, and San Francisco operate when it comes to technology. And that's where a lot of this FinTech is coming from. Um, so I'm, I was very pleased of, of what, he's, uh, what he's doing, how he understands. He can really bridge the divide between, uh, between legislators and, uh, the tech and the innovators in, of technology. So I'm, I'm very excited, very optimistic about him, um, and just seems like a great guy who's going to be um, wonderful to work with. Yeah, and in North Carolina, it's particularly well regarded as a leader in financial services and banks uh, with Bank of America, with major operations for Wells Fargo, and not just in Charlotte, but also Winston-Salem and in Raleigh. And I mean, is there a balance, from your opinion, um, between the traditional banks and these new technologies uh, going yeah. forward? I think the model is probably going to continue. You have uh, these larger banks, then you have these upstarts. And you're going to see some of these, um, these startup technologies that are going to become large entities of themselves. Think of Amazon in 1996 right. and what you see now. That continued on when it could have been at some different, at different points been bought out by a Walmart or somebody like that. Um, but, but then some of them are going to, get, they're going to get traction. They're going to have a user base and they're going to have revenue and then they're going to be acquired by a traditional financial institution. So I think we're going to see um, I think we're going to see it split off into those who want to who want to stay the course and become their own institution, and then those who are going to be targets of uh, of acquisition. I see. And uh, so next, the crypto industry clearly is lucky to have individuals like you and others on the caucus in Congress because these are the conversations that need to be had had, and the industry uh, you know oftentimes doesn't have that um, that platform for influence in the space. So we certainly appreciate you you know discussing having an open door and hearing, uh, hearing the industry um, pain points and challenges. Um, have you had a chance to have uh, additional dialogue with other regulators besides the OCC on creating uh, a comprehensive framework for crypto regulation um, in, in the near future? We have hearings, yeah, hearings, subcommittee hearings. It seems like just using the, the WebEx and Zoom platforms were backed up having our hearings. So, Mm -hmm. uh, I look forward to more conversations. There's been, unfortunately, um, a lull uh, because of COVID-19, but I think mm -hmm. we're back on track. I look forward to these. Uh, definitely with um, uh, Acting Comptroller Brian Brooks, that was, a, that was great, and look forward to more. And with other, um, I don't know if you can call us regulators, but more legislators um, have conversations all the time, mostly with Republicans. I mean, this, again, I mentioned earlier, this is an election year. And so you kind of see a little bit of separation. And then afterwards, you see coming together on issues we can work together on. Uh, but right now, there's just a, there's a lot of brain horsepower um, on this issue on this side, especially as we as Republicans are getting um, a lot of uh, younger talent and more tech savvy talent coming on board. Yeah. It just seems um, we're, we're crossing this generational divide. And I'm really pleased to see how tech savvy um, a lot of the new members are. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, th there's a testament to that with the growth of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. I mean, I think just over the past two to three years, it's really the, the membership in that caucus has grown considerably, if I'm not mistaken. So do you see that as being another uh, good sign going forward? And do you think it'll continue to grow as a bipartisan entity? 
I think it has to grow uh, because the technology is moving and we're a representative democracy. So we really represent what's going on out there. So you're going to see us not as the drivers, but as the, the reflections of what's going on in industry. Uh, and so I'd say just by nature of your growth and in your industry, you're going to see more understanding here and more people are going to join these caucuses. That's great news, and that's encouraging to hear that, too. And I just want to thank you again for making time to speak with us. I know it's a busy day on Capitol Hill, and you're doing the, the great work of the American people. And we want to certainly stay in touch. And hopefully in the, our listeners today, if they have any questions and interest in connecting with individuals on Capitol Hill, some thought leaders, they'll reach out to your office. I hope so. We're easy to get a hold of. Uh, we love talking about this, and I've got a great team. It's not just me here. We've got... Uh, a team of talent that understands this and sees the value of it. So when it's the right time, we look forward to seeing you in person. And before then we can always uh, talk on the phone or do zoom, but we can uh, always zoom or talk on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's good. Well, <laughs> thanks again for your time. Your <laughs> Thank you, Dan. You've been, uh, you've been great. And uh, this is very important. Appreciate what you're doing. Thank you so much, Congressman. We enjoyed it. <laughs>